Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Not even close to October yet, Natalie already made a pumpkin pie. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, we're getting to my time of year. I love pumpkin. And you know, most of the stuff they offer that is pumpkin, I look, we know it's artificial flavors, right? It's not pumpkin necessarily, and they could offer it all year, but no, they hang on to it. Until about mid-September, October, November, and then they take it, they tuck it away, and they tease me with it for nine months. But oh, it was so good. I just had a big old piece swimming in whipped cream, and so I've arrived tonight in a very good place. I'm so happy to be here. I appreciate you being a part of the show tonight. Thank you so much for listening. September has just been nuts. In the best possible way. This coming weekend kicks off the Pennsylvania State Atheist Humanist Conference 2013. And that is a huge lineup. And that's going Friday through Sunday, and I'll be out there. And then the following weekend is going to be Aposticon. And that's happening in Omaha. And you can go to aposticon.org for details on that. And then I'm working on a tour stop in D.C. on the evening of Friday night, the 27th. And I should have details on that on the website at uh, thethinkingatheist.com slash tour. Hopefully in the next few days, we're still getting all the bits and pieces together. The reason I'm going to be in D.C. is I am, and I'm still working out the details, but it looks like I will have the opportunity to do a one-on-one interview with a certain atheist named Dawkins. And I'm pretty excited about the opportunity to, uh, to do that. And again, it's one of those things. We're still sort of putting it all together, but it looks like I'll get a chance to have a conversation with Richard Dawkins, and that's going to be a video and a podcast conversation. There'll be two different formats out there that will air in the month of October. So it's just been crazy. On the podcast schedule for this month, finally next Tuesday night, we're going to talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I've had people begging me to do a show about the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're going to finally do it next Tuesday night. And then the following Tuesday, Dr. Andy Thompson's going to join me on the air for a fascinating look at religion in the brain. He did a great speech in Boston that talked about the placebo effect. And we're going to talk about the placebo effect, especially in relation to religion. And when people go and get prayed for, right? Somebody lays a hand on a shoulder and they pray to God or Jesus or Allah, whoever, and they may show improvement, maybe even marked improvement. How does this happen? What are we talking about? Is it explainable via science? And we're going to go into a great and and very interesting exploration of this with Dr. Andy Thompson. That's coming up. Uh, in uh, two weeks. And then after that, I have David Smalley of the Dogma Debate. Now, some people have said to me on many occasions, hey, you and Smalley ought to get together and do a show. David's awesome people, and um, we're going to do the show. I'm just calling it the Dogma Debate. It's going to be coming up here on the 1st of October. And then in October, it is, of course, the season of Halloween which means ghost stories. Now, I I struggle with the the history of Halloween because I've already done the show. Two years ago, I did about a 30-minute podcast called Halloween History in the Church, and it's easily searchable on Blog Talk Radio or iTunes. And it's a fascinating look at Halloween and how much the church has been involved in the holiday that so many people say is governed by the devil. So part of me would like to go back and explore the topic again, and part of me thinks, well, the information hasn't really changed. Anybody can search it. Should I bother? So I know for sure we're going to do the Ghost Stories show in mid-October, and I just think it's going to be awesome. In fact, if you have a ghost story 
that uh, you would like to share. And I don't mean necessarily a one that you just made up off the top of your head, but one that's part of folklore, one that's an urban legend, one that's the kind of thing that's been told around the campfire. Well, email it to me, podcast at thethinkingatheist.com, and the best ones will be considered for broadcast coming up here in mid October. Let's begin tonight's show. He was born on January 8th, 1942 in Oxford, England. At the age of nine, his grades were among the worst in his class. He was rarely more than an average student. Now, despite his lackluster marks, teachers and his fellow students must have sensed in him a keen mind as they took to calling him by a nickname. They called him Einstein. He ultimately attended the university of his father, University College at Oxford, on a scholarship because his family didn't really have any money for tuition. His father said, you should go study medicine. Well, he preferred mathematics. They didn't have a math curriculum at University College, so he committed himself to the study of physics. He also joined the rowing team, not at the oar. He was of small build, didn't have a lot of athletic ability, so he was what they call a coxswain a position that does not row, but instead controls the steering and the stroke rate of the row. During his time at Oxford, especially in the final year, he struggled with significant health problems. Motor skills became diminished. At one point, he experienced a bad fall on some stairs. His speech began to slur, and his family became alarmed. He came home for Christmas break, and they saw him struggling so much that they started to consult physician. At the age of 21, he was diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and was given two years to live. Of course, by now you know who I'm speaking about. Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking would later say that it was his engagement to his girlfriend Jane that gave him something to live for. He ultimately lost the ability to speak intelligibly. He lost the use of his legs, but his mind remained as keen as ever. He segued from Oxford to Cambridge to research cosmology. After getting his PhD, he started a career that would identify him as one of the planet's greatest minds. And he would become a household name. Almost 50 years after he graduated from Cambridge, His title is now Director of Research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology, and he is known for works such as A Brief History of Time, Black Holes, and Baby Universes, and other essays. The Universe in a Nutshell, On the Shoulders of Giants, and The Grand Design, to name just a few. He's even done a series of science-related children's books. Stephen Hawking has developed theories about the boundaries or lack of boundaries of our universe, and a huge portion of his life's work has been dedicated to the study of black holes. He was inducted into the Royal Society of Science in 1974 and has received awards almost too numerous to mention. What's odd is that to date, he still has never won the Nobel Prize. In 2007... Stephen Hawking, at the age of 65, got to take the ride of a lifetime. He was able to experience zero gravity and float out of his wheelchair thanks to Zero Gravity Corporation. The service involves an airplane ride in which sharp ascent and descent allows passengers to experience weightlessness in flight for several rounds, about 25 seconds long. You may have seen a version of that plane called the Vomit Comet. They used it in the filming of the movie Apollo 13. Stephen Hawking has said this. He says, because there is such a law as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists. Why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. That's from his 2010 book, The Grand Design. To the question, if you believe the universe was created by the Big Bang, what happened before it? Stephen Hawking said this, The question itself makes no sense. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so there is no time for God to make the universe in. It's like asking for directions to the edge of the Earth. The Earth is a sphere, doesn't have an edge, so looking for it is a futile exercise. We are each free to believe what we want, 
And my view is that the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven, and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe, and for that I am extremely grateful. And of course, that's what this show is about. It's called Atheists Who Change the World, a very difficult show to prepare for, because no matter how I format the show and which stories I select to be highlighted, it's inevitable that I'm going to be leaving out hugely important people. And each of our experiences are colored with people who changed our lives, non-believers who are authors or philosophers or even musicians, people out there who touched us in these amazing ways and possibly helped to change the trajectory of our lives. And so as I handpick, sort of cherry-pick these stories, some of what I thought were some of the most interesting stories out there, I'm obviously going to be leaving a lot of people out. And it's an unfortunate byproduct of this type of show. There are so many non-believers out there in pop culture, in our sphere of influence, in literature, in science. We'll be talking about quite a few of those. I also have a few lists on tap. And some of these lists are probably celebrity-driven, or they have a lot of celebrities in them. But I, I don't think that those are something we should brush off. I mean, I think if someone is a person of fame or of, of note or notoriety, someone's a household name, someone is known... If they don't believe, and they are a public non-believer, I think that quite often has merit, and it's something people like to know about. It's an interesting thing. For example, famous musicians, David Gilmour, guitarist, songwriter, vocalist, Pink Floyd, also Roger Waters, an atheist, Billy Joel, American pianist, singer, songwriter, and composer, Dave Lombardo of Slayer, Tim Minchin, the genius Tim mentioned another interview I would love to get. I have no idea how we do it. <laughs> I have no idea how we do it. But ever since I saw him at the Reason Rally, I knew one day I would love a chance to be able to do 30 minutes on the air with that guy. The famous American jazz saxophonist and composer Charlie Parker was a non-believer. Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein, composer of more than 500 songs and 40 Broadway musicals. He was an atheist. Eddie Vedder, the Pearl Jam, and of course, Frank Zappa was a non-believer as well. And of course, tonight we'll take your calls and talk about who were the atheists who were the most influential in your lives. And let's start with area code 229. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who's this? This is Gerald. Thanks for calling, Gerald. We're talking about atheists who changed the world. What do you have for us tonight? Well... As for me, personally, I grew up in a Christian home, and I was actually deist for a very long time, but eventually after I, I let go of all of it. And an atheist that changed my world was actually earlier this year was Lawrence Krauss in a video where he, where he explained how the universe wasn't perfectly made together. And that was really like my one go-to argument for why I still believe in God, and when I just heard like how he laid it all out, I consider Lawrence Krauss an atheist that changed my world. Lawrence Krauss has a great book and speech out there called A Universe from Nothing. And it's easily searchable on YouTube if anybody wants to pull it up and watch it. It's for all of those people who say, well, how did something come from nothing? Well, it's a great response by an expert in the field. Really good stuff. Thank you so much for the call. I appreciate you very much. Take it easy. Thank it. Area code 513. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who is this? Hi. Hi, Seth. This is Mario. I like Dan Dennett. I don't hear too much about him. I think it may be think? because he doesn't really seek to be labeled a firebrand or a controversial figure. He seems to be more of sort of the the gentle giant out there. He seems to be the one who is, you know, he's not. he doesn't go easy on religion, but the tenor of his voice seems to, I don't know, it seems to ingratiate himself to people, and he certainly doesn't make a lot of the more controversial headlines, but he certainly is obviously yeah. one of the four horsemen, and he, he's the real thing. Yeah. The thing he says that is definitely worth considering, he says, you know, as, as uh, atheists, we tend toward the empirical scientific method to understand something. And he said, why not put religion under the microscope and find out 
why it's here, why it's so ubiquitous. You know, what is it that makes it work and take it apart and learn about it. And I, I think that's a good lesson. I've sent him a few requests yeah. for on-air interviews and he's a little tepid. <laughs> and it may be because he's more of a gentle guy and maybe he's he has no idea who I am. He's like, oh, you know, I'm awfully busy. I'll get back to you. But I'm hoping perhaps one day we can get a few minutes on the air with Daniel Dennett. I'm a fan of his work, and I think he's doing a lot of great stuff out there. Thanks yeah. for the call, Mario. Much appreciated. Yeah, yeah take it. All right, take care, take, man. take it easy. She was born in Warsaw, November 7th, 1867, the daughter of a school teacher. By 1891, she was studying physics and mathematical sciences in Paris. She met her future husband and married a year later before being widowed in 1906. But for the time they were together, these two, husband and wife, broke ground in the sciences that would impact the next century. Her name was Marie Curie, and his name was Pierre. Inspired by the discovery of radioactivity by Henry Baccarel in 1896, They developed research and analysis which led to the isolation of plutonium and radium. In fact, it was Pierre who was working with a student who noticed that a speck of radium spontaneously and perpetually emits heat, discovering what is now called nuclear energy. He was also, with collaborators, the very first to report the decay of radioactive materials and the skin burns that radioactive substances can inflict. Now... Together with her husband, Marie was awarded half of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903, the other half going to Becquerel. Shortly after the death of her husband, she accepted his position as Professor of General Physics in the Faculty of Science, the very first female to ever hold that seat. In 1914, she was appointed the Director of the Curie Laboratory in the Radium Institute at the University of Paris. She dedicated herself to the use of radium to alleviate suffering and worked with her daughter in that capacity during the First World War. In 1929, she was given a gift of $5,000 by U.S. President Hoover to purchase radium for laboratory use in a lab built in her home city of Warsaw. Marie Curie was a quiet woman who carried herself with confidence and dignity. She was revered by scientists around the world. Her work has been recorded and cited in numerous papers and scientific journals. She received many honorary science, medicine, and law degrees and honorary memberships of various societies all around the world. In 1911, she received yet another Nobel Prize, this time for chemistry. Marie Curie, Madame Curie died in France in 1934, a pioneer in science and an inspiration to free thinkers all around the world. Really good stuff. It's funny how people whose work a hundred years ago continue to influence, continue to be spoken about all this time. Area code 919. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Michael in North Carolina. I wanted to say Carl Sagan is probably the atheist that most changed my world. Just, you know, the way he described the universe as being, you know, something that's really incredible. And you don't, you don't really need religion to kind of have that sense of wonder about existence, really. It's often the supposed domain of the religious, the sense of awe when it comes to life and the world and the universe around us, you know, somehow the non-believer is never supposed to feel that sort of, uh, you know, the goosebumps, the feeling of awe and amazement when we look around us, because after all, for us, life is void and meaningless. Carl Sagan just did such a great job um, kind of articulating just how incredible just existing can be without needing whatever made-up stories that there are out there. I think, too, there's... I hate to be, I hate to be cliche, but there's a poetry to science. You know, when when the stories of science are told in a certain way, they become some of the most inspiring and fascinating stories ever. And there are some people who are involved in deep scientific work, and they simply cannot articulate that. I mean, they're great with the textbook, they're great with the lecture, they're great with factoids, but as far as 
sort of taking you on a journey. Eh, not so much. Sagan was one of those guys who you could listen to him speak on the order of hours because he excited you about all of the things he was speaking about. He sort of painted a three-dimensional picture and and then was able to tell you why it's something we should be so in awe of and, and just, you know, celebrate the life we have and to be in awe of the universe. It's just one of those, you know, the Cosmos, the 1980 version of Cosmos still stands up today. 30 years later, it's still amazing, even today, which is a testament to his work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Talk about him being able to take someone on a journey. Just watch that series. It's on Netflix. And not, you really get a sense of that. Well, I appreciate the call and a great contribution. Thanks for calling the show. Great. Thanks, Dave. All right. Bye. Uh, not to uh, plug all my own stuff here, but if you want, I was sort of late to the Carl Sagan party. When I grew up, Carl Sagan was a punchline. We were true blue believers, and he was an evolutionist. And so we used to just blow him off. I mean, I watched Cosmos in pieces, but I didn't really watch it. I was a young kid. I wasn't really ready to, you know, receive the information and digest it and to genuinely be curious and ask more questions and to create a learning environment. I was more like, oh, that's not in the Bible. Well, let's just discard that. And um, it was only, you know, when I was 40 that I finally discovered Carl Sagan. And of course, I look back with shame on the way I had spoken about him and the way I had dismissed his work. And I, I sort of grieved the time I lost, you know, the time that he was alive. But I wanted to do sort of a visual interpretation of Pale Blue Dot. And I think that was a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, whatever, I released that to the YouTube page. And uh, so if you have a few minutes, I know you may be familiar with Pale Blue Dot, but I felt like it was kind of ready for an, another visual angle. Being a storyteller, I thought I might have something to bring to the table. So, uh, you know what? I'll make a note here to include the link to Pale Blue Dot. Pale Blue Dot. I will include that in the description box of this show. Brendan sent an email. Brendan out of North Carolina said, You know, when I think about how I was before I lost my faith, I can remember the misplaced animosity I held for the prominent atheists in today's society. I looked at the Matt Dillahunty's, David Silverman's, and Bill Mars with contempt. I despised who they were and what they stood for. Obviously, now that I no longer believe that a bearded man in a dress is using some cloud as a lazy boy, my opinion of these men has changed. But I think it's important to remember what these figures are doing. They are the faces of our cause. They are the ones who have to deal with hates of millions. I would like to take a moment and express my appreciation to anyone and everyone who is taking a stand against the evils of religion. From the Antichrist Richard Dawkins, I'm sure he's been called that, by the way, to Dark Matter 2525, Hemet Mehta, Eugene C. Scott, and Seth Andrews. You're very kind. <laughs> Thank you for what you do. I'm sorry I ever doubted you. But know that you have the support and gratitude of millions, including myself now. Don't give up. Together we can change the world. You know, uh, Richard Dawkins was one of those guys who was instrumental in my own journey. He changed my world in some ways. When I sit down to do an interview with him, I'm, I'm going to be fighting this sort of inclination, this feeling of, I need to tell you how much your work means to me, which must get old. Maybe it doesn't. It doesn't for me, but... You know, he's being pawed at left and right. But I remember that day when I cracked open The God Delusion. It was the third book I'd read in my sort of overt challenge to my former faith, the first time I'd really ever looked at any of his work. I couldn't put that thing down. It was a game changer for me. And, you know, it's, it's, it's said so often that it's cliche. Oh, the God delusion, the God delusion, Dawkins, 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 Dawkins. I mean, and, and you know, it shouldn't be. Quite frankly, a lot of times these things exist, these types of, um, I hate the word cliche, but you know what I'm talking about? I mean, people get there because his name is mentioned so much. The guy's put himself out there. Is he a perfect guy? No. Is he a flawed guy? Yes. Does he always do it perfectly? Hell no. But he's out there living it, sticking himself right in the crosshairs. 
He's in his 70s. He shows no signs of slowing down. And he was instrumental in my own journey. And I think about, you know, it's probably impacted to some degree every video I've ever produced, every podcast I've ever hosted, every speech I've ever given, every conversation I've ever had in the arena of ideas against the damage religion does. Charles Templeton changed my world. Former pastor lost his faith or walked away from his faith wrote a book about it. Dan Barker changed my world. The people of this community changed my world. The people of this community helped to support me in times when things were pretty lonely. Hello, I'm from Oklahoma, and I'm an atheist. I mean, you might as well have dipped me in something radioactive. Oh, let's invite him over for a party. He'll be a gas. In the online community, you know, the men and the women and the young people online, they just, they just were there and continue to be so. Some famous authors who've changed their world or changed the world of at least many people who were their readers. Douglas Adams, of course, the uh, famous author of Hitchhiker's Guide and Restaurant at the End of the Universe. I read that again just this last year. No, you know, it's funny. He's been often imitated. But there will never be another Douglas Adams. Aristophanes, the ancient Greek playwright and poet, atheist, Isaac Asimov, genius, atheist, (laughs) the um, scientist and sci-fi author, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, was a non-believer, Ernest Hemingway, Jack London, Call of the Wild, yeah, he was an atheist. The American playwright, Arthur Miller, right? Death of a Salesman, he was an atheist. Anne Rand. Now, I I hesitated to bring up Anne Rand because she is such a polarizing figure. Everybody flips out. Anne Rand is the devil, or whatever. Uh, This isn't a commentary on her politics. I'm just saying she was a prominent, noted famous, influential person, an author who has been read by millions. She was an atheist. So just, everybody just take a pill, okay? George Bernard Shaw won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1925. Atheist. Robert Louis Stevenson, you know his work, Treasure Island. And the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Kurt Vonnegut, H.G. Wells, Virginia Woolf, all... Atheists. He was born in 341 BCE in Athens. Epicurus. He established the school of philosophy known as Epicureanism. He was an important figure in the early development of the scientific methodology, insisting that nothing which cannot be tested through direct observation and defended through logical deduction should be believed. Now, for Epicurus, the purpose of philosophy was to attain peace of mind and a happy life, freedom from fear, the absence of pain. He considered pleasure and pain the measures of that which is good or evil. He insisted that there were no gods to reward or punish humans after death, that the universe is infinite and eternal, that all things are ultimately material in nature, He himself was never able to escape a life of pain or even a painful death. He died at 72 complications of kidney stones. Here's a story that will resonate with you. There's even a display about this guy in Ken Ham's Creation Museum, of all places. He was born in 1857. He would one day become a defense attorney in one of the most noted court cases in American history. His name was Clarence Darrow an American lawyer, and a leading member of the ACLU. He started out doing corporate work, but it was a case on the subject of evolution that would propel him to the limelight. In 1925, Darrow defended a Tennessee teacher named John Scopes against the state law that banned the teaching of evolution in any state-funded school. The case was the state of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes. It's now commonly referred to as the Scopes Monkey Trial. 
The proceedings took place in the small town of Dayton, Tennessee, and was the subject of intense national publicity. Clarence Darrow argued for the defense. The prosecutor was a guy named William Jennings Bryan, who was a three-time presidential candidate. Now, the trial was controversial on many levels, even between the theologians who were sort of bickering with themselves. The modernists said that evolution and religion were consistent. Fundamentalists said the Bible trumped all and evolution was crap. The press coverage of the monkey trial was overwhelming. The front pages of papers like the New York Times dominated by the case for days. More than 200 reporters from all over the country, and in fact a few from London, were there in Dayton, Tennessee. 22 telegraphers set out 165,000 words a day on the trial. (laughs) More words were transmitted to Britain about the Scopes trial than for any other event previously in America. American journalist H.L. Mencken was ruthless with the creationist. He lampooned them. They called their arguments theologic bilge. And his trial reports of the event are often credited for sort of helping to sway the opinion of the public about all this, against creationism, and helping to pave the way for, decades later, the National Defense Education Act of 1958 which stressed the importance of evolution as the unifying principle of biology. Now, after an eight-day trial and a nine-minute deliberation, Scopes was found guilty. Guilty of teaching evolution. He was fined a hundred bucks. That's about $1,300 in today's money. The verdict ultimately overturned on a technicality. But the trial served its purpose of drawing intense national publicity. The immediate effects of the trial were evident in the high school biology text used in the second half of the 20s and in the 30s. Of the most widely used textbooks, there's only one listing evolution in the index, and in the wake of the trial, under the pressures of fundamentalists, the entry is countered with biblical quotations. That trial is perhaps best known today for the inspiration of the play Inherit the Wind, and there's a film of the same name starring Spencer Tracy. At the time of the verdict, it was seen as a failure for science and a victory for the Bible thumpers. But it was the beginning of a long and important national conversation that would one day see evolution taught as legitimate science in public schools, and Clarence Darrow's legacy remains tied to that historic week in Dayton, Tennessee. Area code 404. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, Seth. It's Alicia from the chat room thanks so much for How calling alicia what's going on well uh we were talking about influential atheists and it came to me i wanted to mention the youtube atheist and the reason why i wanted to mention them was because i had a good friend who was an atheist when i was still kind of on the fence and he kind of dropped some seeds in my mind but it wasn't until I got on YouTube and started searching out different ideas, and even from crazy people like the Amazing Atheist, that they started making me really say, you know what, I've thought this stuff. I I agree. I've always kind of agreed. I don't know why I was on the fence for as long as I was. And and the, the atheistic YouTube community helped me, I guess, find my voice, make me feel like it was okay for me to say I was an atheist. What a tremendous compliment to him. The Amazing Atheist helped to change your world. You should send him a message and tell him that, you know? Well, not even just him, but, like, like, of course you, because, like I said, I'm a big, big fan. And and just the whole community of atheists on YouTube. Just, I mean, because I think each one of them has their style, right? Yeah. And, and of course, TJs tend to be very acidic. But it was like he would grab you by the collar and say, look at this. Yeah. And I was like, well, I can't argue with that. And it's, but just, just the whole community, uh, Steve Shives, um, the, just people like that. I was just like, wow. Do you feel like you had a relationship with the YouTube atheist? I mean, if you look at a Dawkins, a Hitchens, a Dennett, a Harris, you see them sort of operating well, from out there. And the yes, YouTube and atheists seem to be more like, like in your living room. Does that is that accurate yes, with you? Yes, that's what it is. Yes, because the thing was, I could read and admire uh, Hitchens and Dawkins and, and everything, but there was something more, you know, sitting in a pub with a beer, 
at hashing stuff out feel with the, the you you know what I mean? That's what helped me a lot. And so, I mean, I think that the, the ev- everyday average atheist also can be commended, and especially those who, you know, put their face out there in a situation where we're still not fully accepted yet. They can, I mean, some of them still get death threats and some lose their jobs. And even me recently, a woman tried to threaten me. She said, oh, you should be ashamed being a black atheist, and I don't know why you're aligning yourself with those godless white people. And it's a shame that your picture's up there because, you know, somebody could say something and help you lose your job. The implied threats are everywhere, aren't they? Even the people who supposedly are giving you helpful advice for your own welfare are actually sort of threatening (laughs) you, aren't they? You know? Yeah, yeah. What you guys do, I mean, if you ever get down and you wonder if you're doing as you you got, you helped someone like me who was on the fence, and I finally said, you know what, that's why I actually went and I bought, the first thing I bought from you was a little pen, the little atheist with the thinking A pen. (laughs) And I said, I want to put it on everything I wear. I everything. did not set this up, people. I did not tell Alicia <laughs> to call the show and shill for me on the air. But you are so sweet. Uh, and thanks for the words of encouragement. It really does mean a lot to me. And just remember, you're not by yourself. You. you are not alone out there, okay? Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Take it All easy. All right. Uh, bye. I did, did I do a show years ago just on the YouTube atheist? I know I've had several guests. Um, I've had evidence on... Thunderfoot, R and Raw, of course. He's been on several times. DPR Jones. Um, did, did I do a show with Dark Matter? I don't. You know that might not be a, a bad idea for an upcoming show. The challenge is, is that over the years, some have become sort of dormant. Uh, some of the people who you and I'm one of those guys. I used to produce two, three videos a month, and now, physically, mentally, creatively, I'm spent. And now I'm probably doing a video every six weeks, you know, I'm, I'm on a plane, I'm on the road, I'm producing podcasts, I'm speaking, I'm doing all these other things. And, and, and my home life has just gotten busier and crazier. And so I've sort of not, I'm not producing as much. And I'm seeing that's the case with some of the other folks as well. You know, Aaron, he's, he's speaking every five minutes in some place all around the country. And, uh, you know, he's, I think he's writing a book and he's doing all these other things. But that's not a bad idea for a show if we were to get together and just have a, I don't know, just have a round table. Just see how many of these guys we can get on the show at one time and we'll, we'll see if we can get through a show without <laughs> turning, into a, you know, turning into a mob, you know. I don't know, I'll have to digest that and see if that's a good idea. I compiled, sort of guiltily, I compiled a list of actors who are um, atheists and... I'm not one of those people who puts a lot of stock in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, there's some geniuses in Hollywood. You know, there's some geniuses in Hollywood. And then there's the rest of them. You know, I mean, when they open their mouth, the most insane stuff comes. You know, the Jenny McCarthy's of the world. Uh, you know, the more they talk, the more you realize that, wow, this is a whole other planet. So I'm not saying that necessarily being a celebrity gives them credibility as spokespeople. What I am saying, though, is that there are a lot more skeptics, agnostics, atheists in Hollywood than many people realize. Woody Allen, atheist. Robert Altman, the great director, is um, the director of Nashville. He directed the film MASH and much more. Atheist. Kevin Bacon. Paul Bettany, the actor. Jim Broadbent. I just saw him in Gangs of New York. He played Boss Tweed. Richard Burton, the great Welsh actor, atheist. Director James Cameron of Titanic and Terminator. He's working on uh, the sequels to uh, Avatar, isn't he? Guillermo del Toro, atheist. Marlene Dietrich, Peter Fonda, Ricky Gervais, Paul Giamatti, Eva Green, Werner Herzog, Penn Jillette, and Teller, both atheists. Larry King, Kira Knightley, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was an atheist? Now, I, I struggle with this one because, as I understand it, he was into, I don't know, he was always talking in this kind of nebulous, I don't know, he didn't talk about chi, but, <laughs> you know, he was always kind of talking in that mystical way. He was apparently asking 72 if he believed in God, and he said, to be perfectly frank, I do not. But he may have believed in something else. I don't know. Somebody who's more educated on Bruce Lee can tell me. Okay, Seth MacFarlane, atheist. Bill Maher, of course. John Malkovich. Sir Ian McKellen, 
Oh, yeah. Gandalf is an atheist. It's a beautiful thing. You knew he was wise. Julianne Moore, Simon Pegg of Shaun of the Dead, is an atheist. Scotty in the new Star Trek films. Brad Pitt, Gene Roddenberry, the great bird of the galaxy. Creator of Star Trek, atheist. You know, it's funny. I remember, I was, I'm kind of a geek. And when I was a believer, I was reading um, the book Star Trek Memories by, I said, movie memories? I've read both of them by Shatner. And he was talking about Gene Roddenberry writing the very first Star Trek film, Star Trek, the motion picture. And the, the very first picture was not what ended up on screen. It was actually a, a sort of a, a referendum on God. His first script was very much, you know, God was the bad guy kind of deal. And it was rejected by the studios. But I was, I was reading it thinking, oh, geez, man, you know, poor Gene, he's so deceived. He's so deceived. Shatner's agreeing with him, too. These guys, are they're so talented. If only they believed in Jesus. This is how naive I am. And here I am on the other side of the looking glass going, man, Gene Roddenberry, you awesome. Ray Romano, Adam Savage, and Jamie Heineman of the Mythbusters, both atheists. Andy Serkis, Gollum, atheist. Steven Soderbergh, Emma Thompson, Don Siegel, director of Dirty Harry. There's a whole list of these people. Hugh Laurie of House atheist. They are out there. And they are becoming more and more vocal all the time. And I think they give courage to other people. The more they open their mouth, the more they speak, the more they talk, the more they share, the more they create conversation, the more it emboldens other people. I saw a great poster out there that said, I don't post on Facebook. This is a Facebook post. I don't post on Facebook to change your mind. I post on Facebook to remind other people that there are others out there who believe like they do. Something along those lines. And I think that emboldens people. They called him the Waz, or Waz, the computer engineer. Named Steve Wozniak. Co-founded a little company you might have heard of called Apple. Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs met in 1970. They were working on a mainframe computer together and got to know each other. They raised $1,300 between them. They assembled prototype computers in Steve Jobs' garage. And on April 1st, 1976, they formed Apple Computers. And the Apple One sold for (laughs) $666.66. Wozniak later said he didn't price it because... It was the Mark of the Beast. He didn't have any idea what the Mark of the Beast was. He said he came up with that number because he liked repeating digits. I guess it was easy. After the success of Apple I, Wozniak designed the Apple II computer. It was the first personal computer that had the ability to display color graphics and basic programming language built into the machine. It became one of the first highly successful mass-produced personal computers, and I'm sad to say I'm old enough to remember when it was new. He left full-time employment in 87 after 12 years. He's still, I believe, an on-paper employee at Apple. He's certainly a shareholder. He survived a plane crash back in 1981. He was piloting a beach craft. Right after takeoff, there was a crash in Scotts Valley, California. He and his three passengers injured. He had severe face injuries and head trauma, suffered for five weeks with short-term memory loss. Didn't remember the crash or the entire hospital stay. Apple is today the second largest information technology company in the world, after Samsung. And according to Fortune magazine, was the most admired company in the United States in 2008 and in the world for the next four years. It has over 400 retail stores in 14 countries. In the Apple and iTunes stores, the largest music retailer on planet Earth. Apple's estimated value is $415 billion. Steve Wozniak has used his success for philanthropy, financially supporting various educational projects, and since he left Apple, he's even taught computer classes to kids and teachers. He founded other ventures to produce things like the first universal remote and wireless GPS. 
He's a member of the Silicon Valley Aftershock Segway Polo Team, which won the 2008 Woz Challenge Cup. That's awesome. He calls himself an atheist or agnostic. He says he doesn't really know the difference between those two designations. He's received the National Medal of Technology and Honorary Doctor of Engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He later donated money to create the Woz Lab at that school. In 97, he was named Fellow of the Computer History Museum. He was a key contributor to the Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose. He's been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And in 2011, the American Humanist Association awarded him the Isaac Asimov Science Award. Steve Wozniak, a non-believer in God. Area code 937. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. This is Brian from Marysville. Thanks for calling, Brian. What do you have for us today? Well, I wanted to add somebody to the list, a great American author named H.P. Lovecraft, staunch atheist. I didn't even know that till a couple of years ago, but it was one of those things where you're a big fan for a long time, and then you find out later, and you're like, yes, he's one of us. One of my favorite atheists, and a great author. You a fan of his work, are you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are. You mentioned... Uh, Del Toro earlier, he's a huge Lovecraft fan. Uh, it's a big influence on a lot of his work as well. He, you know, it's funny. What is the, um, God, what is the, the work that comes to mind? I, I, Cthulhu, H.P. Yes, Lovecraft? yes. I don't know why I couldn't oh, think of it. I can't, you know, I'm thinking like Invisible Pink Unicorn, right? Because I always put them all together. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, well, the, you know, if if I was religious, if I could pick any god I wanted, I I think I would worship Cthulhu. I don't know why, because he would probably just eat me. He's but, just badass. You know, Look, if, what a great you know yeah. what a great way to go. You know, that's a man's way out right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, by the way, Bruce Lee, I think was mostly a Taoist. Is that it? So yeah, he believed that what the, there, there was always the force of good and evil, and there had to be equilibrium kind of thing. Not even that. It's very non-dogmatic, sort of, you know, just sort of living in harmony with everything and, and inner peace and sort of more emphasis on your own development rather than materialistic wealth and things. I've read the Tao Te Ching. Uh, I've, I've known people who knew Bruce Lee personally, but he died when I was like a year old. But it's sort of, it's not really a religion, religion. It's just sort of a philosophy of, yeah. like I say, living in peace and then harmony and balance. There's, it, it's nice. It's not real woo-woo, like a lot of that stuff. But uh, I think that's mostly what he was into. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the call and thanks for the reminder about Cthulhu. I'm going to pull up that work here very quickly and sort of give everybody a primer because it's awesome. And if there was a deity, oh, yeah. as long as we had a safe place yeah. to watch from afar, <laughs> that's what we would do. Yeah. yeah. And that that would not be a bad idea for like a Halloween show or something. Maybe. Oh, I love it. I love Because I'm also the atheist gun control guy. Let's see. Let's see uh, Remember I, mean, I called and... I remember everybody's giving me shit yeah. about guns. Yeah, just, that's a whole other. That's another show. Let me make a note about that. <laughs> uh, thanks think for the I call, my friend. On, I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I also I think I got you started on that first history of Halloween special you did a couple of years ago. Yeah, I've always I been fascinated, especially by the Catholic Church involvement in Halloween. And, you know, religion yeah. has a long history of taking the awesome stuff that pagans and infidels and, and secular yeah. people are doing, or other, whatever, other cultures, and grabbing it and changing a few things and tacking a religious name onto it, calling it holy, and then celebrating it, and then, quite frankly, using it to make money. And, uh, you know, we look at Christmas and Easter and all these other things, and I find the history of Halloween to be fascinating. So, again, I'll put the link to that show in the description box of this video. Thanks for the call, my friend, and you take care. You too. Bye. All right. Cthulhu is a fictional entity, a cosmic being who first appeared in Lovecraft's story called The Call of Cthulhu. And this was back in the uh, 20s. And there are versions of it, different spellings of it. And uh, it is a monster 
a vaguely anthropoid outline with an octopus-like head whose face is a mass of feelers, scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings. He's been described as a mix between a giant human, an octopus, and a dragon, hundreds of meters tall, with human-looking arms and legs and a pair of rudimentary wings on its back. Just awesome. Now, if you were going to be something for Halloween, of course, you'd have to explain it to most everybody here in Oklahoma. You know, Cthulhu. And they were like, what? <laughs> What's that? Might be a good conversation piece. I don't know. Might be something worth doing. Did you know that um, many of the... I, you know what? You don't need to be told that science is loaded with non-believers and public figures everywhere. Francis Crick, Thomas Edison, Sigmund Freud, Alfred Nobel... Oppenheimer, Carl Sagan, of course, we talked about him. Other people just in pop culture, people who uh, have become household names in one way or another, Francis Bacon. Burke Brethen, guy who created Bloom County and Outland, Pablo Picasso, Pat Tillman, former NFL strong safety for the Cardinals, killed in the mountains of Afghanistan by friendly fire. David Faraday. The golf commentator, of course, George Carlin. Mark Zuckerberg over at Facebook is an atheist. Larry Flint of Larry Flint Publications and Hustler and all that is an atheist. Vincent Van Gogh, the famous artist, post-impressionist painter, lost the ear. Atheist. It's interesting to hear the names of these people, the people who so often we reference in our everyday lives to find out that they are indeed non-believers in God. Area code 325. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Mickey, Seth. Thanks for calling the show, hey, Mickey. I What's going like, on? Oh, well, you know, you, you mentioned some of the atheists like Penn Gillette, and I was thinking he was kind of a turning point to me. But I often thought, you know, he's maybe a little bit more in your face than some others. But uh, for me, uh, I think that the, the way he injected humor into it, it just worked for me. He's definitely someone who will get your attention and keep it, <laughs> you know? Definitely. And uh, I remember the first time I heard him speak out loud as an atheist, you know, he was just challenging, fearlessly challenging God. I was, it made me uncomfortable. And, you know, looking back, that was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. Shake my tree a little bit. You know what? be uncomfortable, you know? I think so. I think he made me uncomfortable and made me really question what I was believing. Uh, I, I think I've been an atheist just a little over a couple of years. And sorry, I'm a little nervous talking. Oh, you're doing great. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're doing great. Well, thank you. Um, you know, just and, and not not trying to stroke your ego here, but uh, when I when I listened to your book, I thought, you know what, this for most people, I thought the way that you delivered it, uh, just just your approach and the way you were telling it and how you came to atheism yourself was very similar how I came to it. As a matter of fact, I recommended your book to my sister, who I believe recently. Uh, uh, listened to it and kind of got her thinking. And I think that probably worked for her better than Penn Jillette would have. But. So she was a believer and she was curious? Um, just... No. Um, no, she um, she said she stopped believing probably much longer, much before I did, probably about a decade. But she's still kind of in a, in a spiritual kind of uh, thing. She wants to believe in something spiritual, which is fine. But... For me, I mean, I'm, I'm quite comfortable calling myself an atheist, just so it, I think it clears it up for some people. It, they can put their mind around that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if, that, if that's easier for you to get your mind around it, then by all means, I'm an atheist. Well, you know, it's, it's pretty direct in its challenge of religion, but I think it approaches the subject with compassion, with understanding of people who were raised in devoutly religious cultures. and. I've had a few people who pick it up and they just won't, I mean, they'll get three chapters in and they'll put it right down. And I've had other people who, you know, they haven't felt attacked. And so they just kept on reading. And maybe in a few years when they get to a point where the questions come, maybe it will give them courage to keep going and continue to ask those questions. I certainly hope so. I think so. And, and you know, I must say, uh, when you opened up and uh, you were talking about your relationship with your parents and how the last thing in the world you wanted to do was to hurt them. And again, you talk about the compassion. I thought it was very compassionate there. And uh, and I feel the same way, which I, I haven't come out to my parents. 
I'm not sure if I see the value in that at this point. I mean, they're pretty elderly, so I'm just, uh, I mean, we live in different parts of the world. and uh, I totally get but, it. I mean, I really, you know, it's yeah. because you're compassionate <laughs> and care that you have those types of discussions with yourself. You know, what's the cost benefit here? Will it create more harm than good? Will it really change anything? Is it important for my parents in the winter of their lives to know all about this? And if it's not important, you've got other fish to fry, other battles to fight. I totally respect it, man. I really do. But my sister and and the one that uh, is a little more on the spiritual side, it's kind of funny because it's it's when, when she kind of revealed that to me that she had rejected Christianity. I just wanted to tell her everything at once. I wanted to tell her about, you know, the Pendulet and Papa Pendulet. I went to Richard Dawkins. And then there's like everything I could get my hands on by uh, Christopher Hitchens. And I just wanted to hit her with everything at once. And I, I kind of had to kind of pull my own reins back and say, okay, let me take this easy. Okay. <laughs> a little at a time. So, uh, yourself. like I said, turn her on to your book. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then I, I, I took her off to watch uh, Bill Maher's uh, uh, religion. Relig- help me with the name there. Religious. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific there you go. Religious. And so I said, Hey, you got to watch this. It's right there on Netflix. Check it out. I've got <laughs> so, it in my uh, queue right now. And then I've seen it like three or four times. I still have it in my instant queue because from time to time, I'll just fire it up and just watch part of it. Oh, it's, and, uh, it's you know, just fantastic. He, he does a great job in that film of drawing a big circle around the insanity of it. You know, it just really, and I think there are a few inaccuracies in there. He was doing some references to Jesus and Horace and a few other things that are kind of zeitgeist ish. But uh, overall, it's a tremendously right. solid film. Religious Bill Maher, if anyone gets a chance and hasn't seen it, it's certainly worth your time. Thanks so much for the kind words and Definitely. the encouragement, my friend. And thanks for listening to the show. You're oh, much you appreciated. Betcha. Thank you, Seth. Take it easy. Bye bye. There's another show I thought about doing. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. But I didn't think that that topic would carry a 60 to 90 minute podcast. You know, you'll probably get a couple of sides on it. One person says, yes, you can be spiritual without being religious. And the other says, it's all a bunch of crap. And then you're not going to really cover a whole lot of new ground. I just didn't think a whole show would support it. But it, you know, it does make for an interesting conversation, and I hear it quite a bit. I'm not a religious person, but I, I am spiritual. Well, define spiritual. Uh, do you mean like a supernatural membrane, a consciousness, some kind of an energy field, those types of things? Or do you see spiritual as more of a human condition when you feel awe and wonder? and all? If it's a, is it an emotion-based thing? Is it, is it about hope and comfort? Uh, well, you know, how do you define that? And everybody seems to be defining it a little bit differently. It's hugely complex. Ayan Hirsi Ali. I remember reading her book, Infidel, and just being fascinated by her story. A huge critic of Islam, she wrote uh, the screenplay for a movie directed by Theo Van Gogh called Submission. And that film led to the assassination of Van Gogh in the streets and death threats against Ayan Hirsi Ali and probably death threats for the rest of her life. She's spoken all around the world and inspires a great many people in her fight for not just women's rights, but human rights in the face of radical Islam. Richard Branson of Virgin Media, more than 350 companies under that umbrella, heavily involved in humanitarian projects. He holds the uh, world records in long-distance ballooning, And he said in one of his autobiography segments, he said this, I do not believe in God. Of course, we mentioned Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, American writer and neuroscientist. He's written the book, The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason, and Letter to a Christian Nation. He says this, Atheism is not a philosophy. It's not even a view of the world. It's simply a refusal to deny the obvious. Of course, the great Christopher Hitchens, who died in 2011 writer, public speaker, and amazing debater, columnist at Vanity Fair and Slate, and wrote God is Not Great, Portable Atheist, and Letter to a Young Contrarian. Hitchin said this, The only position that leaves me with no cognitive dissonance is atheism. It's not a creed. Death is certain, replacing both the siren song of paradise and the dread of hell. Life on this earth, with all of its mystery and beauty and pain, is then to be lived far more intensely. We stumble and get up. We are sad, confident, insecure, feel loneliness and joy and love. There is nothing more, but I want nothing more. 
Taslima Nazreen, the atheist Bengali Bangladeshi doctor and poet and writer and feminist. She lives in India in exile, death threats from Islamic fundamentalists from all over the world. She's written almost 30 books, and her work highlights the treatment of women, the mistreatment of women in Islamic countries. Atheist. James Randi, the amazing Randi. Atheist. The author Salman Rushdie. He's written 15 books, including the Satanic Verses, which resulted in the Iranian Ayatollah Khomeini to call for his death for blasphemy against Islam. He still lives largely in hiding. Mark Twain, atheist. Andrew Carnegie. Richard Feynman, the scientist, contributed so much to the development of quantum mechanics. The Theory of Quantum Electrodynamics, QED. In fact, he won the Nobel Prize for it in 1965. Noam Chomsky, American philosopher and writer. Peter Higgs, you know the name from the Higgs boson. Theoretical physicist and emeritus professor at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. The late Stephen Jay Gould, paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, and science historian. He used to talk quite often about punctuated equilibrium, part of the evolutionary lexicon. He actually sort of contributed that to the conversation. So many others. One more call quickly before we wrap up. 330, you're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. This is Craig. How you doing? I'm well, Craig. Thanks for calling. What's going on tonight? Well, I want to give a shout out to uh, the people associated with American Atheists. When I first became an atheist, didn't really have a whole lot of benefit of the of the internet. But uh, when we first did get access, the first things that helped me solidify my position were Frank Zindler's writings. Frank Zindler has some excellent stuff that he wrote about the mythical Jesus, things like that. And then I met a woman named Arlene Marie, who is the state director in Michigan. She made me into the activist that I became. Um, I remember contacting her about a road sign that uh, had a religious message right after 9-11-2001, and she told me, okay, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so I thought about it. I ended up uh, writing the Michigan Department of Transportation. They took the sign down the next day, and I told her about it, and I met her, and she really solidified my uh, activism. And uh, the whole group there, just a bunch of people that are been longtime activists. Changed your world. Actually changed how you act and react and perceive and and sort of altered, in some ways, the trajectory of your life. How you approach these things from now on is different because of that one encounter. Well, thanks for the contribution tonight. Thanks for calling the show. Thanks, Seth, for having me. All right. Take care of yourself. I'm thinking he, somebody in the chat room just said Neil deGrasse Tyson. Somebody else said, I think, Brian Cox, Miriam Namazi, all these names I know I've missed tonight. If somebody has changed the world or your world or what have you, just put it in the comment section. <laughs> I know I've missed... A ton. It's interesting that he mentioned the American Atheist, because that's the story I'd like to finish with tonight. It has to do directly with the American Atheist and its founding. She was born on April 13th, 1919 in Pittsburgh. And as a baby, she was baptized into the Presbyterian Church. Her name was Madeline Murray O'Hare, eventually. It was in her teens when she read the Bible through, and it was shortly after that that she embraced atheism. She would become one of the most polarizing and controversial figures in recent history. Married to a guy named John Henry Roths in 1941. She was Madeline Roths. And she left during the Second World War to be in the Women's Army Corps. It was there that she fell in love with an officer in the military, a guy named William Murray. She divorced her husband, but Murray was a devout Catholic. He would not divorce his wife, but she took his name anyway. She started to call herself Madeline Murray. She completed a law degree, but never passed the bar, never practiced law. In the 1950s, she and her two kids left for Europe with a plan to defect to the Soviet embassy in Paris and reside in the Soviet Union, as it promoted, quote, state atheism. They were denied entry and ultimately returned to Baltimore in 1960. It was in 1960 that Madeline Murray made headlines. She filed a lawsuit against Baltimore City Public Schools. She said it was against the Constitution for her son William to be required to participate in daily Bible readings in class. 
The lawsuit was ultimately consolidated with another famous case, Abington v. Shimp. Wound up in the Supreme Court in 1963, the court voted 8-1 to one against the mandatory reading of Scripture in class. The mandatory Bible readings in state schools were officially banned. Ironically, William the Son became a born-again Christian in 1980 and ultimately a Baptist minister. His mother never forgave him. Madeline once even sued NASA over the reading of Genesis on the Apollo 8 mission. The Supreme Court rejected that case. She married U.S. Marine Richard O'Hare in 1985 and became Madeline Murray O'Hare. Arriving in the city of Austin, Texas, she founded what she called a nationwide movement which defends the civil rights of non-believers, works for the separation of church and state, and addresses issues of First Amendment public policy. That's a quote. She would be its first chief executive officer. The organization, of course, was called American Atheists. In the years that followed, Madeleine Murray O'Hare became the voice and face of atheism in this country. She received hate mail and death threats constantly. She became active in the courts, filing lawsuits against violations of church-state separation. At one point, she even sued the city of Baltimore, demanding that that city collect taxes on a piece of property that was owned by the Catholic Church. She started an atheist radio and television show. The TV program was, at one point, carried on more than 140 outlets. She became a regular on the Phil Donahue talk show. She was once the chief speechwriter for the 84 presidential campaign of Larry Flint, who we mentioned earlier in the show. The woman was fearless, impatient, often caustic, and extremely abrasive. She cared not at all about popularity or public opinion, and the woman was ruthless in speaking out against religion, which she once said in a Playboy magazine interview was a crutch and a, quote, irrational reliance and supernatural nonsense. Here's a quote from the uh, 1965 October Playboy interview. She said this, Perhaps this sort of claptrap was good for the Stone Age when people actually believed that if they prayed for rain, they would get it. But we're a grown-up world now, and it's time to put away childish things. But people don't, because most of them don't even know what atheism is. It's not a negation of anything. You don't have to negate what no one can prove exists. No, atheism is a very positive affirmation of man's ability to think for himself, to do for himself, to find answers to his own problems. I'm thrilled to feel that I can rely on myself totally and absolutely, that my children are being brought up so that when they meet a problem, they can't cop out by foisting it off on God. Madeline Murray is going to solve her own problems and nobody's going to intervene. It's about time the world got up off its knees and looked itself in the mirror and said, well, we're men, let's start acting like it. She's quoted to have said this to the religious, quote, I'll tell you what you did with atheists for about 1,500 years. You outlawed them from the universities or any teaching careers, besmirched their reputations, banned or burned their books or their writings of any kind, drove them into exile, humiliated them, seized their properties, arrested them for blasphemy. You dehumanized them with beatings and exquisite torture, gouged out their eyes, slit their tongues, stretched, crushed, or broke their limbs, tore off their breasts if they were women, crushed their scrotums if they were men, imprisoned them, stabbed them, disemboweled them, hanged them, burnt them alive, and you have nerve enough to complain to me that I laugh at you. Yeah, that was Madeline Murray O'Hare for sure. (laughs) I myself, you know, struggled with Madeline Murray O'Hare. You know, I see some of the interviews she's conducted and I think, man, you know, that's just so foreign to my particular style. We'll come back to that. On the 27th of August, 1995, she, her son John, and her granddaughter Robin disappeared. On the door of the American Atheist office, which was locked, by the way, there was a typewritten note which apparently finished with John's signature. And the note said this, 
The Murray O'Hare family has been called out of town on an emergency basis. We do not know how long we will be gone at the time of the writing of this memo, unquote. At the O'Hare home, no travel arrangements had been made. There was still food on the table. Madeline's diabetes medication was right there, had been left behind. The dogs were at the house with no one to care for them. A few days later, via telephone, the trio called and claimed that they were on business in San Antonio. Shortly after that, John took delivery of $500,000 worth of gold coins from a jeweler in San Francisco. I guess the coins belonged to them. For about a month, the employees at American Atheist received phone calls. Random calls from Robin and John, no explanation given. The employees said their voices sounded distant and odd and strained, disturbed. After December 28, 1995, no other calls were made and no other communication came. The public fascination was at a frenzy. Many people speculated that Madeline Murray O'Hare had just simply run off with the money. She'd absconded with the kids to some hidden destination far away. It took one year for Madeline's son, William, to file a missing persons report. He said, well, there was so little evidence of foul play. All three were eventually declared legally dead. It came to light that David Roland Waters was a man who had worked for the organization American Atheist. He'd also had previous conviction for violent crimes. He'd actually stolen money from American Atheist before, like 50 grand. That prompted Madeline Murray O'Hare to write about him specifically in the members-only section of the American Atheist newsletter. And she roasted him. She revealed his previous crimes, and she talked openly about an incident that happened in 1977 where this guy Waters allegedly beat his mom and urinated on her. Waters' girlfriend later said the article so enraged him that he fantasized about torturing Madeline Murray O'Hare in gruesome ways. Police eventually concluded that David, Roland Waters, and accomplices had kidnapped the three had forced him to withdraw the money, had gone on huge shopping sprees with that money, and then they ultimately murdered and dismembered them. In January of 2001, Waters finally led police to the bodies on a ranch in Texas, and what the police found was horrifying. All three corpses cut into dozens of pieces with a saw. Identification had to be made with dental records and DNA. Waters was given 20 years in prison. He only got 20 years in prison for kidnapping, robbery, and murder, and he was told to pay back the stolen money. Of course, he was worth nothing. He died of lung cancer in 2003. Even today, opinions are all over the map on Madeline Murray O'Hare. Was she a poisonous, angry malcontent who'd rather burn a bridge than build it? Or was she a fearless crusader for the separation of church and state in a hugely religious time and culture? I mean, did those types of hard battles require a steel jaw and that razor-sharp, no-bullshit attitude that just cut through all the platitudes, all that apologist tap-dancing that was going on? Well, I can only offer my own perspective here, and while I really don't relate to many of the methods of Madeline Murray O'Hare, our styles are very, very different, I think that there can be no denying, at least from my opinion, that, that she brought a necessary conversation to the limelight at a time when it was hugely unpopular, politically incorrect, and often dangerous. Lover or hater, I mean, she lived it. She put herself out there and she fought tooth and nail for what she thought was right. Perhaps if Madeline Murray O'Hare was alive today, she wouldn't want to be liked or even admired. Perhaps 
She would simply want to be understood. She would want the Constitution to be understood. And she would sound the charge for the rest of us to sound that charge for enlightenment, education, science, and freedom from superstition. She once said in the Petition for Relief, Murray v. Kurtlet, 1959, quote, Your petitioners are atheists and they define their lifestyle as follows. An atheist loves himself and his fellow man instead of a god. An atheist thinks that heaven is something for which we should work for now, here on earth, for all men together to enjoy. Thank you so much for listening to the show tonight. I will see you next Tuesday evening as we delve into the Church of the Jehovah's Witnesses. If you have a perspective on the issue, some experience with the church, you're welcome to drop me an email, podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com